welcome you once again to the upper room and we're coming to you from just outside the center field fence of a field that our kids grew up playing on it. They actually played on it when they were like 13 and 14 years of age. So we have a lot of memories here and it's not this particular field that we're that interested in. I just wanted to give you a little backdrop as to how we're going to approach this lesson and that is that there is a play. Okay, baseball really isn't known for plays uh, so much as just this ongoing you know, process of you know, scoring runs, getting outs, that kind of thing. But there are sometimes plays called, like you would see in football or maybe basketball, but this particular play that is called in baseball has to do with uh, the, the runner on third, the catcher behind the plate, the man at the plate, or the person at the plate getting ready to hit, and the pitcher, okay? It's a very specific play, and many people, myself included, believe it's the most exciting play in baseball. It's not a home run, it's not even a triple. The most exciting play in baseball, I think, is what's called the squeeze play. Now let me describe it. Some of you obviously are already understanding what I'm talking about. But it's exciting because it's a very risky play. And the play is this, that you want to get the runner home from third at all costs. So there has to be one out or less. And the batter is going to lay down a bunt. Now this isn't just any kind of a bunt. This is a bunt that really has nothing to do with the batter getting on first base. It has everything to do with getting the guy on third home because you need this run so desperately. I would go so far as to tell you, you could watch a whole season of Major League Baseball and only see this happen once or twice. That's how special, unique, and exciting this play is. But you can see it developing because what happens is the runner on third begins to break for home as the pitcher is just going into his windup and beginning to throw. The idea is that the hitter is going to lay down a bunt and if he misses the ball or pops it up, then there will probably be two outs. The hitter simply has to get his bat on the ball no matter where the ball is, which is incredibly difficult. Even if it's above his head or below his knees, he's got to get the bat on the ball because the, the runner on third is committed to coming home. All right. A lot of risk involved. In fact, if the hitter doesn't get the sign, Let's say the hitter's looking at the third base coach and he misses the sign for the squeeze. And, and what I'm describing to you is called the suicide squeeze because it's all or nothing. It's either going to work or we're going we're gonna to die here. You know, so, so if he misses the sign and simply lets the ball go by him, or even worse, if he misses the sign and he swings away, he could literally pull it and hit the guy coming home, which amounts to injury, incredible harm. Okay, so it's a high risk, high reward play that doesn't happen very often, but it's really important. So what I just described is the suicide squeeze. There's another kind of tamer approach to do it. It's called the safety squeeze. And that is if the batter gets the ball on the ground, then the runner coming home breaks for home as soon as he sees the ball going to the ground. Okay, it's the safety squeeze, it's the suicide squeeze. The suicide squeeze is much more exciting, much more dangerous. Okay, what is the point of what I just described to you? And <laughs> to some of you, I know you're bored, but that's okay. It serves a purpose. The point of this play is that it produces pressure on the other team. While the goal is to put pressure on the other team to execute perfectly, now while, as you can tell by the way I described this play, while there's a lot of pressure on the team that's trying to field the ball, there's just as much pressure on the team trying to pull this play off. So it's a pressure-packed moment that really causes people who are really interested in baseball to kind of take a deep breath or stand up to watch what's about to happen, okay? So again, the goal is to put pressure on the other team. Now, there's another way, that's why they call it the squeeze. Again, squeeze this run in, but it really squeezes and puts pressure on the members of both teams, actually. There's other ways to put pressure that produces something really positive, and that's the simple idea of squeezing fruit, 
right? I mean, you, you know, when they, they want lemonade, you got to put a squeeze on the lemon. You want grape juice or wine, you got to put the squeeze on the fruit. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, one of my favorite memories was in the fall, we, we had a cider press and we'd go get a bunch of apples that had fallen from trees that nobody wanted to eat. And then we'd squeeze them in the cider press and the juice would flow out and we'd have cider for weeks and months in the future. And so it was a lot of fun to do that. But the concept is that good things come when things are, as I said, possibly in a play on the, at the plate, when things are squeezed, pressure is applied. And we see this throughout scripture. And today, especially, we're going to see an example of Jesus talking about the squeeze, what I want to call the squeeze play. An older man was driving through town at 2 a.m. in the morning and a policeman saw him and kind of wondered, you know, he found a reason to pull him over. So he pulled him over and he walked up and he said, sir, uh, can I ask what you're doing out driving at 2 a.m.? And the man said, well, I'm on my way to a, a lecture about alcohol consumption and what that does to the body and smoking and uh, the results of smoking and even just staying out late, that kind of thing. The policeman stepped back and kind of thought for a second and said, who in the world is giving a lecture at 2 a.m. in the morning? And the guy behind the steering wheel said, that would be my wife. <laughs> Sometimes people mean for pressure to help people, right? That, that would be this guy's wife. But it's not always feeling like help to those who are being squeezed. That is where we're going today. We're in a series uh, that we have called the lucky ones. And that is Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount with blessed are those. How fortunate are those people? And then he, you fill in the blank and he describes the kind of people who are so fortunate. And, and if you missed the first couple lessons or five, six lessons of this series, it's not that we're lucky like Las Vegas lucky or horse race lucky, uh, card lucky. It's that we're just so fortunate to experience what God has for us in his kingdom. And Jesus kind of outlines this, and we've said this before, but these Beatitudes at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount build on one another. And so they begin with Jesus saying, you know, how fortunate are the people who are needy. Because if you don't feel needy, you'll never need the kingdom of God. You'll never see a need for God in your life. How fortunate are the needy. And then he goes on to say, and how fortunate are those who mourn, because once you realize how needy you are, it, there's this kind of a guttural emotional response. You can almost not stop the tears from coming when you realize what a terrible place you're in in your life without God's presence. So the, the needy then mourn, and then there's this sense of meekness, this sense of humility that comes over us. So this meekness that Jesus describes speaks of a, a humility that most people don't have. But you must come to the throne of God on your knees saying, I'm in such great need. I cannot accomplish in my life. And I'm not talking about business and athletics and all that kind of thing. I cannot be the person that I should be in my life without you. It's a very humbling place. And then the response to that naturally is to seek to be right with God. So he talks about that. How fortunate are those who seek to be right with God, to hunger and thirst for such a thing. Now, once we seek God with our heart, God responds with mercy. And that's kind of the next step. How fortunate are you if you have received the mercy of God, if you have experienced the mercy of God and that mercy kind of flows right through you. Now, once we've received the mercy of God and that, that mercy then just kind of flows through us, we experience a purity of heart. How fortunate are those who are pure in heart, who have had God cleanse their heart as David prayed, creating me a clean heart, O oh God. And that's kind of the next part of the process as these beatitudes build on one another. The purity of heart that comes only because God has extended mercy to us. And then in our last lesson that we talked about, then we obviously realize what peace with God means. And now we want to become peacemakers. He calls us, says, those of you who are so fortunate to have experienced peace with God, now you can extend that peace to others in relationships that you have throughout life. So once we're at this place of, of have experiencing a pure heart and peace in relationships and life is good, 
<laughs> the hammer gets dropped down in the last beatitude in verse 10. The pressure gets applied. All of a sudden we see this pressure, and it's not pressure to make more money, not pressure to have a nicer house, not pressure to climb the ladder of success. It's a different kind of pressure that now comes to us uh, who live in the kingdom of God. And here is how the pressure is described by Jesus. Verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. It's as though Jesus is saying, and the final test that you know you're a part of my kingdom is that pressure is going to be applied to your life. You're going to experience the squeeze play, all right? And the question then becomes, how do we react to that? Are we prepared for such a life? Is that really what you think you signed up for? Most of us signed up for peace and a pure heart and all those things, but Jesus doesn't stop short of being so fully honest with us. The result, the end result, is that there will be pressure applied to you like you've never felt before. Now it's fair to ask, and I'm guessing that the multitudes who were listening to Jesus on the hillside when he taught this lesson might have said, now what exactly do you mean by persecution? I mean, can, can get more specific, Jesus. And so Jesus, without even hearing the question, senses it, I believe, and now we get to verses 11 and 12. Let's read them together. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. He gets very specific. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. <laughs> so Jesus doesn't step back and say, uh, maybe, it, maybe it won't be that bad. You know, maybe, maybe it'll be doable. Don't worry about the persecution thing. Let's stick with what I already taught you. He doubles down and three times in three verses he says, you will be persecuted and how fortunate you are. So I want to get into the details and unpack this really quickly. And then I want to show you an example of how it works in uh, some lives of people who probably were there listening to this lesson. So when Jesus talks about persecution, he gets more fine with his definition of persecution, and he begins with insults. Question for you, how do you deal with insults? Do you get insulted very often? Uh, do you, does it destroy you? Great story about Sir Winston Churchill who had this nemesis who was this lady and they were always going at each other. And at some point, you know, the lady said, if you were my husband, I would give you poison to drink. To which, you know, Churchill did not back down and say, oh, that scares me. That's so mean. Instead, he responded immediately, if I were your husband, I would drink that poison. <laughs> not many of us are that quick on our feet to deal with insults that come our way. And is that really how we should deal with it is the question. But the first thing he talks about is insults. The second thing is basically per persecution. Again, uh, it's an undeniable fact that if you can live in the kingdom of God, persecution comes. And that begs the question, if I'm not being persecuted at all, am I really living in the kingdom of God? Am I really living at it as a citizen of the kingdom of God? Am I really living as a child of God? Because the natural implication is there will be pressure applied to my life. It's funny how we get pressure applied to our lives and we panic, right? But Jesus, I believe, is saying, why are you going to panic? There's no need to panic. I have told you this beforehand. Expect it. So there's the insults. Uh, there is the uh, persecution in general. And then Jesus goes on to say, there will be lies and accusations. Okay, how do you deal with that? I'm going to be right up front with you and tell you this is my least favorite. I hate being lied about. I hate accusations that are false. The idea of this phrase, lies and accusations, is that sometimes people will lie right to your face and sometimes people will lie behind your back. They'll accuse you of things. They would never accuse you to your face, but they'll make accusations about you behind your back. I would be really interested to know how you deal with that. And I'll be really honest and say, as I said before, it has bothered me for years when people lie and they don't think I'm bright enough to know they're lying or they lie about me or make accusations about me or my family, but it's usually been about me. And it just drives me crazy. 
But that is a reality of being in the kingdom of God. Jesus says that will come. I can only remember one time that somebody outside the kingdom, somebody uh, of a pagan nature lied, that I know of, lied to me or, or lied about me. But when it comes to people inside the church, supposed Christ followers, I cannot count the number of times people have made false accusations, have lied about who I am, lied about what I've said, lied about what I've done. And maybe that's why it just grinds on me to, to see this happening in the church. And yet, Jesus predicted it. Of course, we assume he means outsiders, that the pagans will lie about you. And they may, and they will. But the one that really gets to me, and maybe it gets to you, is when you're lied about, accused of things by people who claim the name of Jesus. Just absolutely is a bird in my saddle. <laughs> so Jesus is uh, unpacking this for us. This is what you can expect. In fact, I've had a poster in my office when I was at the local church, and I still have it. I don't put it up anymore. But it's a poster of sheep, and in the middle of the sheep is a wolf in sheep's clothing, and it simply says, they are amongst us. And that is the most guaranteed reality, that we think that we're talking to a flock of sheep, followers of Jesus, but in our midst there are people who have every intention of destroying, especially leaders inside the church, but destroying one another. Okay, so Jesus says this is what you can expect. And then he gives this admonition to us, and he describes what the reaction of kingdom people will be. This is where it gets difficult. He says, the reaction of a kingdom person, the reaction of my children will be to rejoice and be glad. <laughs> How's that fitting for you? Rejoice and be glad. Especially that phrase, be glad, has a very specific meaning I want to read to you. It means to exult, to rejoice greatly, to be overjoyed. Literally, listen to this, literally to skip and jump with happy excitement. That's what the word means. Jesus is actually saying, so when these terrible things happen to you, the people in my kingdom will be overjoyed. Now, why would we be overjoyed? Why would we go skipping down the road going, how lucky are we? And again, that's why I love this title. How fortunate are we? It's our lucky day that people want to, you know, kill us. That people want to slander us. That people want to accuse us of things that aren't true. And so the unspoken question to Jesus has to be, how is that possible? Why would we ever go skipping and jumping down the lane saying how lucky I am to have this happen to me? And he says, rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven. You're not a citizen of this earth. Your citizenship is in heaven and it, your reward will be wonderful. So Jesus tells us your reward in heaven will be great. It'll be a great reward, something we can look forward to. And the second reason is really interesting. He says, and you can rejoice because you are joining a cloud of witnesses, as the book of Hebrews says. You're joining the prophets who did what I told them to do, and they were persecuted. They were accused. They were lied about. They were beaten. He says, you have joined that select group of people in the world that the world will never forget. Now, so it's an interesting a reaction that Jesus says, my people, my children, uh, the people of my kingdom will deal with this in this way. Now, there's one caveat I want to make sure I uh, communicate with you before we move on and see an example of what Jesus is talking about here. And the caveat is this. Remember he said, how fortunate are those people who are persecuted for righteousness. Remember he began the Beatitudes by saying, how fortunate are the people who desire, who thirst and hunger to be right with God. And it's that being right with God that brings on this persecution and this uh, behavior towards us. It's not, the caveat is this, it's not just us being idiots. I don't know how else to say it. It's not just us being punks. It's not just us being difficult people to be dealt with. All right. A lot of us uh, have this habit of being annoying, difficult people to be around, and then we get persecuted and we say, oh, persecuted for the Lord. I'm talking about when you truly have aligned with me and do what I tell you, and then you get persecuted, how fortunate you are then. So that's a really important caveat. So that basically is what Jesus is talking about. 
And again, it's really important to understand, he's saying, when you are in alignment with me and doing what I ask, pressure is going to be applied to your life. And you better expect it. How fortunate you are to have that pressure for the reasons I gave you. Now, I want to take a little side trip for a second and just talk about the culture in which we live. Because too many of us who are members of the kingdom of heaven are also trying to, we're straddling the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of this world. We're trying to have a foot in each place, a foothold. And you need to understand what the kingdom of this world is about. And there's a book that I'm going to ask you to uh, invest in because it really will help you with understanding what this culture is about right now and how it got to this place and how we're to respond to it. This book is called Faithfully Different and it's written by Natasha Crane and she does a, just an exquisite job of outlining how we got to this place in our culture and the dangers of us trying to live in both the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. Let me give you four kind of pillars that she gives as the understanding of how this culture operates, what's important to this culture. And then I'm going to have you uh, discuss something about that. So she calls it the secular viewpoint. And to summarize the secular viewpoint, it's about self-rule. Not being ruled by God, which is what Jesus is talking about in the Beatitudes. Here's how you bring your life under the rule of God in the kingdom of God. God is that king. Jesus is the king. But self-rule. What's most important in this secular society is self-rule that I'm in charge. And here are the four pillars she gives, and then I'll give you a discussion question to talk about it. Here they are. Number one, feelings are the ultimate guide. All right. What matters most is how I feel, how anyone feels. Okay. That runs in opposition to God's word. Second pillar, happiness is the ultimate goal. No sound like they're the same, but they're slightly different. How I feel is most important, and ultimately, whether I'm happy is really the goal. My goal in life is to be happy. Pillar number three of our secular society is judging is the ultimate sin. How dare you ever judge anyone else? How dare you ever tell somebody else, that's not really how we're supposed to live, okay? And then the fourth pillar is this, God is the ultimate guess. In other words, the secular world in which we must live for the time being says that your guess with God is as good as mine, but how dare you say that you're right about who God is. Nobody can be right about who God is. It's just opinion. Okay, discussion question. I just want you to talk about what you just heard. Uh, how do you see it in this world? How do you, how do you react to it? H how difficult is it to not be a part of that thinking? Have a great discussion. I bet you had a great discussion about those four pillars of secular worldview that Natasha Crane talks about. And in reality, when you hear the term progressive Christianity, that's really what she's talking about. Progressive Christianity is the idea that Christians have now adapted to the secular worldview and are trying to have it both ways, trying to live in the kingdom of God and in secular society. And it's a challenge, but they're finding a way to do it. Problem is, Jesus said, this is how my kingdom works. And you're either fully in or you're not. Dr. Robert Malone is a brilliant guy and he goes deeper into this. And I want to give you a quote from him. It's kind of lengthy. So I'm going to slow it down and let you think through what he's saying, but he describes this, what's happening in our culture in great detail. He says this, cancel woke and gender dysphoria associated behavior patterns all share a core idea that individuals have an innate right to not encounter facts, ideas, or beliefs that are inconsistent with their own. Did you get that? The way it's going now is that people fully believe that I should never ever have to deal with facts and realities that I don't like. He goes on, these belief systems revolve around the idea that people have a right to be protected from experiencing cognitive dissonance. Okay, what is cognitive dissonance? Cognitive dissonance is a mental stress 
or strain a difficulty I should not have to deal with, all right? It causes me to panic, that kind of thing, when I have to deal with realities that I don't like. He goes on. These behavior patterns often are associated with a personal sense of victimhood. So Jesus' instructions in the Beatitudes, which now end with, and you will experience pressure, that is absolutely not okay in our society. You should never have to experience the squeeze play. You should never have to experience pressure in your life from anybody else. What I need you to see is that Jesus' instructions are the exact opposite of the world now in which we live, the culture in which you and I live. Really important. That's why trying to live with a foot in God's kingdom and a foot in this world's kingdom absolutely cannot happen. It just doesn't work. The way Jesus put it in other terms was you can only serve one master. You can't serve two masters. And that's what most people in the modern church are trying to do. They don't want to offend anybody because the worst sin you could ever commit is to hurt somebody's feelings. And yet Jesus said, that's the way my kingdom works. If you're going to be in my kingdom, your feelings are going to get hurt. And you, you better plan on it. You better deal with it now. Now here's what I want to do. I want to go to an instance in the early church, Acts chapter 5. And I want to read, instead of just referring to it, you need to hear exactly what goes on. Let's pick it up. I'll break every once in a while to mention something and we'll keep going. Acts chapter 5 verse 12, it's Peter and the Apostles. Sounds like a great uh, band, but it's not a band, it's, you know, the original church. It begins this way. The Apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as the Solomon's Colonnade. But no one else dared to join them even though all the people had high regard for them. Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, crowds of both men and women. As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets and beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. They are so thrilled. They, they say, even if you get in this guy's shadow, you could be healed. Verse 16, Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. Uh-oh! Undeniable facts! Undeniable realities! They're seeing people healed in the streets, and people want to join them, but they're afraid. Why are they afraid? We're about to find out why they're afraid to join the apostles in what they're doing, and we're going to call this the squeeze play. Verse 17, the high priest and his officials who were Sadducees were filled with jealousy. These guys think they're religious. They think that God has great favor on them, but we're about to find out they're very secular in the way they think. First of all, jealousy. Verse 18, they arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. What is the offense? The offense is they're doing something that the secular culture does not like and does not approve of. Cultural leaders are now applying the pressure. This is exactly what Jesus was saying. You now will be persecuted. Verse 18 starts with the word but, and it's a big but. Don't you love the big buts in scripture? Bad news, they're in jail. But... An angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail, and brought them out. Then he told them, go to the temple and give the people this message of life. I love that phrase, the message of life. The same thing that they're going to share with people is the same thing that we share with people today. It is a message of life. Sometimes it's called the, the gospel or the good news. But it is a message that brings life. Now there's going to be more problems. You think, oh, they're free, life goes on, they'll never be touched again. Not so much. Verse 21, so at daybreak, the apostles entered the temple. They went right back. That happened at night. As the sun rose, they went back into the temple, as they were told, and immediately began teaching. 
notice they didn't go to their homes and say let's let's pray about this okay let's get some counsel about this i'm not sure we should really defy the culture's leanings and suggestions and demands they go right back to obeying what they were told to do that will be the question many of us today when we feel the pressure we're going to say now let's pray about this is this really i mean could this possibly be what God wants. I mean, uh, I'm feeling the squeeze play. Continuing with verse 21. When the high priest and his officials arrived, they convened the high council. This is the Sanhedrin court, the supreme court, the most powerful men in their culture. They convened the high council, the full assembly of the elders of Israel. Then they sent for the apostles to be brought from the jail for trial. But when the temple guards went to the jail, they're gone. So they returned to the council and reported, the jail was security locked with the guard standing outside, but when we opened the gates, no one was there. This is what they report. They're in trouble. This gets spooky. Verse 24, when the captain of the temple guard and the leading priests heard this, they were perplexed, wondering where it would all end. Then someone arrived with startling news. Those men you put in jail last night are standing in the temple and they're teaching the people. The captain went with his temple guards and arrested the apostles, but without violence because they were afraid the people would stone them. Then they brought the apostles before the high council, the Sanhedrin, where the high priest confronted them. We gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name. How dare you defy us, he says. Instead, you filled all Jerusalem with your teaching about him, who's him, <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth. And you want to make us responsible for his death. Let's go back to that phrase in verse 28. We gave you strict orders to never teach in that man's name again. We told you, we, here's the word, we censored you. We censored you. We shut you up, or so we thought. Discussion question. Can you talk about any examples of censorship going on in our culture today? <laughs> Have a fun discussion. We won't censor you. So one of the foundational principles of our culture is the freedom to express yourself, the freedom to speak freely, right? And you know now there is a, a list of things that you must not speak about. You must agree, you must never disagree with the narrative. In fact, I had already written this and then later this past week, the administration from the White House under the Department of Homeland Security. Now, maybe you're not old enough to know this, but in 2002, the Department of Homeland Security was established by President Bush and the purpose, the very clear, concise purpose was to protect our culture from terrorists. So under that guise now we have what they're calling the Disinformation Governance Board. It's really the Ministry of Truth and what they're saying is no longer can you speak against our narrative and this has been the case for some time let's go through a quick list of the things that we are never to speak against in this culture right now number one that our 45th president was put in place by russians number two that the outcome of the last election should ever be doubted number three that covid 19 can ever be disputed regarding its reality, where it came from, all the other things that came along with COVID-19. We are never to question that. And now we are being told what we can and cannot say about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. There is a narrative, and probably the most permeating narrative right now is never question, never doubt the narrative that a man can become a woman and a woman can become a man, that gender fluidity, you must never, never question that, all right? That is censorship. Which brings me to two of my favorite memes. One is credited to Chuck Norris, who apparently, evidently, said, I was once a man trapped in a woman's body, and then I was born. <laughs> and then recently, the Babylon Bee, that satirical website that is a kick. They wrote this headline, God criticized for assigning gender at conception. 
God's in trouble for doing that. G.K. Chesterton put it this way, the decay of society is praised by artists as the decay of a corpse is praised by worms. Know this, that the society, the secular society in which we now live is a duplicate of the society in which the apostles lived. It is true. They were being censored, we are censored, and it has to do mostly with who we believe is the truth. And we don't believe government is truth, we believe Jesus Christ is truth. Get used to it. We go back to our story, verse 29. But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human authority. Is that going to be your response? We will do what God has told us to do. And we don't care what you say, what threats you levy against us, it doesn't matter. We will never comply to a secular society telling us how to live. That is what they were doing. They had been prepared for this moment. Then they go on in verse 30. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him. Isn't that great? I mean, these guys are not holding back. Yes, you murdered them. Yes, you are lying. You killed him by hanging him on a cross. Then God put him in the place of honor at the right hand as prince and savior. He did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit who is given by God to those who obey him. They share the message of life with these guys who want nothing to do with it. So the secular, I know they think they're pleasing God, but they are secular in the way they think. The secular council responds this way. When they heard this, the high council was furious and decided to kill them. What comes after censorship? Cancel. We will cancel you out. That's what they're promising. That is the secular world in which we now find ourselves, in which Jesus said, prepare. How fortunate are you when the pressure is on, you will be ready. Are we ready? It's at this point in the story, I'll just summarize the rest of it, that Gamaliel, one of the Sanhedrin court, stands up and he basically says, calm down. He's hearing this talk of murder. He says, calm down, and here's his reasoning. He says, listen, and he gives some examples. You know, several years ago this happened, a few years ago this happened, and what he's saying is, there was an uprising. There were certain men that rose up, kind of like this Jesus of Nazareth, and it amounted to nothing. He says, just hold your horses, if we give it time, it'll amount to nothing. Is he right? Well, he's partially right because he goes on to say, if it's of God, we can't stop it. If it's not, it'll go away. He's right in that sense. He was wrong in the sense that it'll go away. 2,000 years later, it has still not gone away. So we get to verse 40. They, the Sanhedrin, called in the apostles and had them flogged. Don't minimize what this is. They got a whipping. 39 times, not 40 because they didn't want to surpass the law, but 39 times Peter and the apostles were whipped. They were beaten. They were bloodied. Then they ordered them never again to speak the name of Jesus, and they let them go. There, that'll solve it. I mean, we try to intimidate them by censoring them, and now we bring physical pain into their life and say, don't ever do it again. And so the apostles learned their lesson, and they went home and went back to doing what they were doing before they met this Jesus. <laughs> no, watch what happens. We're going to call this, how lucky are we? <laughs> Verse 41, the apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of of Jesus and every day in the temple and from house to house they continue to teach and preach this message Jesus is the Messiah what did they do they fulfilled Jesus prophecy how fortunate are you when you are have the pressure squeezed on you because you will do the right thing you will rejoice you will go down the lane the dirty road skipping and jumping and saying we're the luckiest guys in the world it actually happened that way. Isn't that incredible? We read the Beatitudes and get to that Beatitude in verse 10 and go, oh, well, I didn't sign up for that. These guys realize now, not only did we sign up for this and Jesus said we would do it, he said, they say, how lucky are we? God, God saw us as worthy. Is that how you feel? I would love to be found worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. How fortunate are we? Is that 
how we're going to approach this time coming? Now bear with me, I want to do a little history lesson. You probably remember that Constantine lived in the early 300s, of, you know, the 4th century, but the early 300s, and he was an emperor in Rome, and he was converted to Christianity somewhere around 320, 330, and he made it really the law of the land. Up until then, they had persecuted Christians. Now, all of a sudden, the persecution ends, supposedly, and the church becomes united with the government, which is never a good thing. And then 40 years later, along comes a pastor, a preacher, a man of God. His name is John Christosom. He lives under the reign of the Emperor Arcadius, and under that reign and with the church, Christosom starts preaching like John the Baptist did, like the prophets of old did, and the church does not appreciate it. He just calls sin what it is. He calls people out. Exodia, the, the empress, he calls her out. And so eventually the emperor calls him in and he threatens him four times. He threatens him first that he'll banish him. Then he says, I'll slay you. And then he says, I'll take your wealth from you. And then finally he says, I'm going to make sure all your friends disappear. Listen to the reaction from John Christosom to the emperor living out the words of Jesus. He says, Sire, you cannot banish me, for the world is my father's house. To the threat of being slayed, he says, No, you cannot, for my life is hid with Christ in God. And then, as far as having his money taken from him, Sire, that cannot be done either. My treasures are in heaven, where none can break through and steal. And then to the threat that he'll be driven away from all his friends, he says, That you cannot do either, for I have a friend in heaven who has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Chrysostom lived in Constantinople, where the Eastern Roman Emperor lived, which is now Turkey, and he banished him into the Black Sea. And on his way to banishment, the Lord took him home. He died as though the Lord was saying, thank you, thank you, thank you for being willing and ready to do what I ask you to do. Now come home, faithful servant. Isn't that a great story? I bet that's a story you've never heard before. This guy, even though they banished him and he died, we still have something like 600 of his messages today from the fourth century. Isn't that a great story? I want to read to you from three letters out of the New Testament, starting in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten, and sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same thing. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail, and when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. <laughs> you knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. He's just repeating what Jesus said, and now he says, y you did this. Congratulations, you have lived this way. James chapter 1, verse 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. And finally, Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, 12. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad. Sound like Jesus? For these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. Watch how he ends it. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed for the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. Are you ready? Do you consider an incredible opportunity that's coming our way? Or do you fear it? You see, to live in the kingdom, as Jesus brings down the hammer at the end of his Beatitudes, to anticipate pressure, to anticipate being put under a squeeze, is what we do. And we will be ready. Are you ready? John the Baptist is certainly, in Matthew 11, a great example of this as he sits in prison for doing the right thing and he has his doubts and he asks Jesus, he sends his disciples to say, are you really the one or did we miss it? Notice that Jesus does not get frustrated or angry with him. Instead, he says, go back and tell John that the rejected have now been received in my kingdom. The dead are given life in my kingdom. 
and the poor get good news in my kingdom. That's how my kingdom works. John was looking at the temporary things around him. And even being in prison is a very temporary thing. Jesus is saying, I know, I get it, it's okay, but I'm working on eternal answers here. John wasn't asking too much. He was asking too little. He was asking for temporary relief from his circumstances and, and did I waste my time here? And Jesus is saying, you should ask even more that the world is changed by what we bring, that is the kingdom of God. In 1998, a movie came out called Saving Private Ryan. You probably saw it, it won something like five Oscars. A kind of an amazing uh, story. In the story, Tom Hanks plays a guy named Captain Miller and he is given seven soldiers and a mission, and that is to go find Private James Ryan because James Ryan, unbeknownst to him, had his three brothers already killed in action, and somebody way up says, get him out of there, get him home. Let's not let his parents have to deal with a fourth son killed in action. So their mission is to go find James Ryan. And at one point in this mission, as they're traveling in the direction they think he is, they have this really kind of scary moment where they're fired upon by German soldiers and so Captain Miller, uh, Hanks, tells his troops we're going to take this hill, we're going we're to have to encounter these, these guys and deal with them. As a result they lose one of their members. After one of them is killed this fight breaks out amongst his soldiers. Now, some more background on this, he has been playing this kind of game with them. They've been asking him, what do you do for a living when you're not the captain of our troop here? And he has never told them. He said, you can bet on it. You can all make wagers on what I do for a living. And so that had been going on for some time. And as his troops are turning on each other and even pulling guns on one another, because some of them side with Captain Miller and some of them side against him, and there's this incredible conflict going on, it's then that he so brilliantly says, what's the pool up to? In the midst of all that tension, he lightens it by becoming human. And he says, I'm going to tell you what I do for a living. I'm a high school English teacher. I coach baseball in the spring. And they're all just stunned. And they, they stop arguing. And then he goes on, and I want to read to you what he says. All right? Because they are under pressure. They are being squeezed. Here's what he says. I don't know anything about this Ryan. And I don't care. The man means nothing to me, it's just a name. But if going to Ramel, France, where they believe he is, and finding him so he can go home, if that earns me the right to go back to my wife, then that's my mission. And then he finishes this way. I just know that with every man I kill, the farther away from home I feel. But this is the mission. I love that scene because you and I need to come to grips with this is our mission. We are to live out God's will in his kingdom on this wretched earth as it's become. It's our mission. Whatever is destined by God for to happen to us is the way it goes. We just know that with every trial, with every time we're squeezed, with every time pressure comes on us, every time we're lied about and accused of things that aren't true, how much we miss home. Ultimately, we want to go home. Let me read to you from Revelation chapter 13, verse 9. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Anyone who is destined for prison will be taken to prison. Anyone destined to die by the sword will die by the sword. This means that God's holy people must endure persecution patiently and remain faithful. That's our mission. Are you up for it? The squeeze play is coming. Be prepared. I told you the story of John Christosom. One more quote from him. When you see the church scattered, suffering the most terrible trials, her most illustrious members persecuted and flogged, her leaders carried away into exile, don't only consider these events, but also the things that have resulted. The rewards, the recompense, the awards for the athlete who wins the games, and the prizes won in the contest. You and I live for home and for a time when we will be rewarded for enduring and honoring God in the midst of the squeeze play, in the midst of the persecution, in the midst of the lying and accusations that are coming. My admonishment to you, my encouragement to you is be prepared.
That's how Jesus ends the Beatitudes. How fortunate are you? How fortunate am I? How lucky are we that he prepares us for what's coming and it's all worth it, that he would consider us worthy. Thanks for joining us.